Hello, my name is Kenton Hoxie. Our first session will be on the Beatitudes. Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. We have eight messages on the Beatitudes, and this is the first one. Jesus was teaching the multitudes in what we now know as the Sermon on the Mount, in Matthew 5. And this sermon continues through Matthew 5, 6, and 7. So the Beatitudes are just a small portion of that entire sermon. And it is the Beatitudes that will be our focus now. That word, beatitude, is not in the Bible. But because each of those sentences begins with the word blessed, we call them collectively the Beatitudes. We'll be looking at each one of them. Now I'd like to look at that word, blessed. And then we'll look at the meaning of the term poor in spirit, and we will look at the meaning of kingdom of heaven. Briefly, we'll look at each one. Now, there is a certain sign that we tend to use for that word blessed. But there are two Greek words which are translated blessed. The first is eulogeo. And our word for eulogy comes from this Greek term. And a eulogy is a message that is delivered at a funeral. So the Greek word is almost the same as our English word eulogy. And the English word eulogy means to speak well of someone. So it has actually two meanings, to speak well of someone and to act well toward that person. So the Greek word has those two meanings, to speak well and to do well towards someone, but the English word has just the meaning of speaking well about someone. The second Greek word is makarios. And this is what you are before God, fortunate, well-off, happy, blessed. This is the Greek word that's used in the Beatitudes.
and it refers to our condition before God. The condition of being under God's favor. And I'll be looking at that more in depth later. Makarios does not refer to all people. It only applies to those who are God's children. Jesus used this term for those who are poor in spirit, those who mourn, those who are meek, those who are pure in heart, and the rest of the Beatitudes. And he is talking about his people being in a state of blessedness in God's eyes. That they are in a state of favor before God. So this is a beautiful doctrine. Okay, last year Yari and I were discussing this with a seminary student, with a, a Lutheran pastor. We took a course from this pastor last year, and then I corresponded with him by email about this term. He said, from what I gather, eulogeo is more like eulogy, meaning to speak well of someone. And makarios... refers to the state we are in. It is our state before God. Makarios refers to the way God views us. So when I checked with this Greek teacher on this, he confirmed that, yes, this was right. He said that eulogeo is a transactive verb. And includes the two parts of speaking well and doing well towards someone. So when I bless you, I am not only saying something good about you, I am actively doing something to you or for you. So it is stronger than our English cognate. A cognate means a word that is similar across two languages, like eulogy and eulogeo. The word eulogy does reflect the root meaning of the two parts of the Greek word, but it loses the punch of the Greek word. Because the Greek word means to speak well and to act well towards someone, to do good to someone.
So to bless someone in the sense of this word, I must not only speak well of them, but support them, encourage them, assist them. I must do good toward them. Like verses that tell us that it is not enough to simply say the right things, but we must do them also. Okay, that term eulogeo is not the one used in the Beatitudes. Let's move on to the one that is. Makarios is an adjective. You will notice that many of the English translations of Matthew 5 translate this word as happy. I looked at Strong's Concordance and that it lists happy as one of the meanings of this word. One of the possible translations. One of the possible translations of the word. Eulogeo meant to speak well and do good towards someone. But, but the verb form of makarios is God declaring us. declaring us blessed, declaring that we are in a blessed state. And makarios is more difficult to translate, especially in sign. Since we use the term or the sign for bless as a verb, this is not the um, Greek meaning of it, but it is to declare us blessed. It is that God looks on our estate and says it is good. So God looks on those who are poor in spirit and declares it good. It is not that God sees people who are poor in spirit and then does this verb of blessing them, but that God declares those who are poor in spirit to be in a blessed state. Okay, we have many uses of this word bless. For example, when somebody sneezes, we declare, God bless you. We are not saying that God declares you to be in a blessed state. So the Beatitudes declare what we are before God. Remember, they are what we are from God's perspective. So in Psalm 1, verse 1, it says, blessed is the man who walks not in the counsel of the ungodly. Nor stands in the path of sinners. Nor sits in the seat of the scornful. So God declares that person to be in a blessed state, a blessed condition.
Then Psalm 32, verses 1 and 2. Blessed is the person whose transgression is forgiven, whose sin is covered. So for the person whose sin is covered, God declares that one to be in a state of blessedness. Blessed is the man to whom the Lord does not impute iniquity. My Greek teacher, Ron, said this is not a good English translation from the Hebrew. It is because God withholds blame for that iniquity that the person is in a state of blessedness. And so God looks on that person and declares them to be blessed. Remember I said that some Bible translators take that word, blessed, and translate it happy. Some even translate it as very happy. But there are many who are happy who are not in a state of blessedness. There are sinners who are happy, who are not under God's state of blessedness, but are happy in their sin. So that is not the ideal word to choose to translate that term. Sinclair Ferguson, uh, who I will be quoting a lot, wrote, Blessing and its biblical opposite, cursing, So if we think of blessed as happy, then the, its opposite would be anger. You can see how these are opposites. This blessing is simply fellowship with God, the experience of his covenant promise, that I will be your God and you will be my people. It means having a right relationship to God and enjoying him as we should. Recently, our Sovereign Grace Deaf Conference staff met. And talked about how we were lights to the children. And how our happiness and joy glorifies God. And so I encourage encourage them that it was important for them to enjoy the children and for the, and for the children to enjoy their time as well. So they would look back on it with fond memories and of enjoying God.
and godly character should lead to joyful living, should lead to praising God eternally. For if we are united with him, we should have great joy rather than being grouchy. So now that we have looked at that term, blessed, I'd like to look at the term poor in spirit. Because I, we need to keep moving along. So poor in spirit. First, I'd like to tell you what it does not mean. And I've taken these four things that uh, poor in spirit does not mean from Thomas Watson. And modernize the English for you. Poor in a state. It doesn't mean someone who's in debt, who's in debt or who's broke because of overspending. It doesn't mean someone who, is not, who has not wisely managed their money. There are Christians like that who are unwise in handling their money and need to improve to uh, honor God in how they use their money. But that is not what this term poor in spirit means. Nor does it mean spiritually poor. Everyone is spiritually poor, but not everyone sees that they are spiritually poor. I remember my boss saying that he hoped when he got older that he died instantly of a heart attack rather than a lingering death. But I told him that what was important was that he died in faith. And my boss said, well, he would go to heaven. He was a good father and good husband. He, he would surely be in heaven. He did not see that he was poor in spirit. He, he did not see that he was spiritually poor. This term does, also does not mean mean-spirited, poor-spirited, someone who is rude and unkind. And fourthly, the term does not mean making oneself poor. It doesn't mean a wealthy person renouncing all of their riches and giving up all of their possessions from their house to everything else. That is not the meaning of this term, poor in spirit. It, it doesn't mean renouncing all your possessions to live in a monastery. And so those who do that can't pat themselves on the back and say, well, I have now become poor in spirit. So those are the things it does not mean. Now let's look at what poor in spirit does mean. It is an emptying of oneself. A 
and Mary and Joseph took Jesus to the temple before Simeon and God promised Simeon that he would see the Messiah. And Simeon had been waiting. When Mary and Joseph brought the baby, Simeon was an old man by that time. And he said, Behold, this child is destined for the fall and rising of many in Israel. It's an interesting term for the fall and rising of many in Israel. Let me explain. Lloyd Jones wrote that poor in spirit really means an emptying. We cannot be filled until we are first empty. In the same way that someone who is physically full, and they've had plenty to eat, cannot continue to eat until they are emptied and then they can be filled again. You cannot fill with new wine a vessel which is partly filled already with old wine. You must first pour out the old wine and then pour in the new wine. And likewise, we must give up the sin that we hold on to. We must empty ourselves of that sin. Now, there are always these two sides to the gospel, a pulling down and a raising up. In preaching the law and telling people how they have offended God through their various sins, People feel convicted and they are pulled down. <clears throat> then there is the preaching of the gospel of Christ's crucifixion on behalf of sinners. And that is the raising up. You see, first is the guilt that pulls the person down. And then the gospel message which raises them up. So under the conviction of sin under the gospel, we are brought down and under the preaching of Christ's crucifixion in the gospel, we are raised up. The best picture of being poor in spirit is the parable of the Pharisee and the tax collector. And this exactly illustrates what is meant by poor in spirit. I'm going to summarize this parable for you. Jesus said there were two men who went to the temple. One was a Pharisee. And he prayed. And the other was a tax collector who also prayed. And the parable contrasts their prayers. 
the Pharisee stood before God and said, I thank you, God, that I am not like other men, an extortioner, unjust, adulterer. Thank you that I am not like this tax collector. I fast twice a week. I give tithes of all that I possess. You see that the Pharisee went before God thanking him that he wasn't like other people. Now the tax collector had a terrible job where he went around and got taxes from people and forced them to pay taxes. And people hated these tax collectors. They were akin to prostitutes in that they were looked down upon by all of society. People hated the very mention of the tax collectors. And they hated the tax collectors who were evil and pocketed money on the side. The tax collector entered the temple and stood far off. He, he didn't even raise his eyes toward heaven, but he beat his breast, saying, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. And Jesus, in comparing these two, said, I tell you, this man went to his house justified. In other words, he was declared in it to be in a state of favor before God. And the Pharisee, who was not poor in spirit, was not. Okay, suppose a deaf prostitute came in here now and people might shun her and look down on her. And suppose she cried out in sorrow over her sin, begging God to forgive her. And you look down on her. Then you are the one with the problem. not her. Now let's look at what poor in spirit means. This term poverty in spirit means the same thing as poor in spirit. I was talking to a hearing pastor and asked how he became a Christian. He said he had lived a wild life, and, including drugs, and that Jesus had saved him. That's all he could say, that Jesus had saved him. He was poor in spirit. He didn't talk about anything good that he had done. He didn't congratulate himself for anything. He talked about the terrible sins he had committed and how God had saved him. Poor in spirit means being spiritually bankrupt. Because of our sin, we owe a debt to God that we cannot possibly pay off. We have nothing to offer in exchange for the forgiveness he gives us.
I was talking to a friend who asked me whether or not God uses scales and weighs our good actions and our bad actions, and if our good outweigh our bad, then we can go to heaven. And I explained that our bad deeds are so terrible that we can't possibly do enough good to balance them. And that Jesus took all of those bad deeds of ours and died for them on the cross. That is the only way for us. That is the only way for the good to outweigh the bad is through the death of Christ. person who is poor in spirit sees his sin. The tax collector saw his sin, but the Pharisee saw all of his good points. My boss uh, that I told you about before, in the same way, did not see his sin. I ask you, do you see your sin? The person who is poor in spirit sees nothing good in himself. As we study the law of God and compare it with our own lives, we are left convicted of our sin. We know that there is nothing good that dwells in us. And then we are like the tax collector who cries out, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. One who is poor in spirit has a broken heart and a contrite spirit. We know that people who are caught in sin might immediately instinctively apologize without truly being heartbroken over their sin. They just give a flippant apology. And that is not being poor in spirit. Being poor in spirit is, is recognizing that there is nothing good in you and that you have offended God, that your sin is an offense to God's holiness, recognizing the disparity between God's holiness and your own sin. One who is poor in spirit sees the need for Christ. The person who is poor in spirit recognizes that there is nothing they can do to clean themselves up before God. A person who is poor in spirit looks to Christ, that knowing that they are saved purely by what Christ has done, know, knowing that they are saved only through the name of the Savior. The person who is poor in spirit realizes they can do nothing to save themselves and that they rely wholly on Jesus to save them. So I'd like to give you some examples from the Bible of people who were poor in spirit. I have four examples. First is Isaiah. 
in chapter 6, verse 5. He says, Woe is me, for I am undone, because I am a man of unclean lips, and I dwell in the midst of people of unclean lips. For my eyes have seen the King, the Lord of hosts. If you put a frog in warm water and slowly heat that water, the frog acclimates and stays in the water. Whereas if you took a frog and dumped it into boiling hot water, it would immediately jump out. And America today is much like that frog in the warm water that is slowly heated because this sin is getting worse and worse. You see it on TV, on a national network television. You see nudity and people don't react to it anymore because we're like that frog in the warm water that is getting slowly hotter and hotter. We see movies that, that we don't react to the sinful things in the movie because we've gotten accustomed to them. If we were like Isaiah and could see the holiness of God, then we would respond in the same way. We would respond like him, Woe is me, for I am unclean and live among unclean people. And we would understand that we are deserving of hell. And Gideon also was poor in spirit. He said, he, he knew, recognized that he was nothing. When God called him to lead Israel, Gideon replied, how can I save Israel? For my family is of no importance. We are the weakest in Manasseh. Gideon was admitting that his family was of no repute, of no importance. They had no skills, no uh, knowledge. Gideon was saying his family was lowly, that there were other families who were much more prominent and that Gideon then admitted, I am the least in my father's house. So Gideon saw that other people were better than he was, and that even his brothers were better than he was. But God said, I've chosen you to save Israel, to deliver Israel. That is being poor in spirit. And that's how we feel when we're called to minister somewhere. We realize that we cannot save, that we cannot deliver, but that God uses those who are poor in spirit. And so God used Gideon, this lowly man from a lowly family, for his glory. Another person who was poor in spirit was Peter. Did he say that? 
after Jesus called the 12 disciples, This is a story that took place when Peter had been fishing all day. I've sometimes watched skilled fishermen. And as seen their boats. They don't look like anything. And their boats look like nothing, like some cheap little thing. And yet, they are able to do great things. And Peter was a skilled fisherman, but he had fished all night and had caught nothing. And then Jesus told him to cast his net on the other side. Now, Peter could have responded with derision, saying, you know, I'm a skilled, experienced fisherman, and you don't know what you're talking about. But that's not the attitude of a disciple. I know I might have been tempted to do that, but we need to guard against that. We need to recognize that God uses all different kinds of people. And when Peter cast his net on the other side, it was so filled with fish that it broke. And Peter was hauling in that catch of fish he had to call in another boat to help him. And when this happened, Peter fell before Jesus and said, Depart from me, for I am a sinful man. That was being poor in spirit. Paul also was poor in spirit. And here, talking to Timothy, Paul says, This is a faithful saying and worthy of all acceptance. Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners, of whom I am the chief. Paul was saying, Christ came to save sinners, and I am the worst of sinners. Compared with other people, I am the worst sinner. This is Paul who wrote many of the epistles of the Bible. Paul the missionary. Paul who preached to the Gentiles. Paul who planted churches throughout the Gentile world. Calling himself the worst of sinners. Sometimes people put their pastors on a pedestal, but pastors likewise are sinners, just as we all are. And Paul said of himself that he was the worst of sinners. Remember when Paul confronted Peter for his sin, and yet here is Paul saying that he's the worst sinner. That is being poor in spirit. So 
Now we'll look at some quotes on being poor in spirit. John Calvin wrote, the poor in spirit are they who see nothing good in themselves, but fly to mercy for sanctuary. Such one was the publican, the tax collector, who cried out, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. That is being poor in spirit. Sinclair Ferguson wrote, Jesus is describing the person who sees his spiritual bondage and is conscious of the debt of his sins and knows that in himself he is bankrupt before God. All he can do is cry for mercy and depend upon the Lord. Do you have this poverty in spirit? Do you recognize that you are empty in yourself and that you depend wholly on him? If so, then you are poor in spirit. If not, then you don't have that poverty of spirit. Martin Lloyd-Jones wrote, It is to feel that we are nothing and that we have nothing and that we look to God in utter submission to him and in utter dependence upon him and on his grace and mercy. Recognizing that we are nothing and that we have nothing our skills, our leadership qualities are nothing. All has been corrupted by sin. And all we can do is cry out to God for mercy. Thomas Watson wrote, Poor in spirit, then, signifies those who are brought to a sense of their sins and seeing no goodness in themselves, despair in themselves. And sue, meaning plead, wholly to the mercy of God. Poverty of spirit is a kind of self annihilation. Not meaning suicide, but an end to anything in ourselves. That there is nothing in ourselves and that everything is in God, that we rely wholly on his mercy. You see this over and over again in each of these quotes. And I ask, do you have this poverty of spirit? The Beatitudes say, blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. So now we'd like to look at that term, the kingdom of heaven. In scripture, you see the term, the kingdom of heaven, and you see the term, the kingdom of God. And Maybe you've wondered if their meanings are different. But they mean the same 
thing. And I'll show you some verses to show that these are synonymous terms. Matthew 13, verse 11. He answered and said to them, Because it has been given to you to know the mysteries of the kingdom of heaven, but to them it has not been given. The disciples asked Jesus why he taught in parables. Jesus explained that he taught in parables because the mysteries, the hidden things, were given to them, his disciples, but not to the others. So here we have the term, the kingdom of heaven. Then in Mark 4, 11, we have a parallel passage. Again, we have the disciples asking Jesus why he taught in parables. And Jesus' answer this time in the book of Mark is stated this way. To you it has been given to know the mystery of the kingdom of God. But to those who are outside meaning those outside of the church, those who are lost, do not understand the parables. But to those who are saved, the parables are made clear. So you see in these parallel passages that these two phrases are synonymous. The kingdom of heaven and the kingdom of God are one and the same. So what does this term mean? Sinclair Ferguson wrote, The kingdom of God has come in Jesus. Through faith in him, we enter the kingdom. The kingdom belongs to us. The only way we enter the kingdom of God is through faith in Jesus Christ. If you want to enter his kingdom, you must believe in Jesus. For there is no other way to enter. There is no way apart from Jesus. In conclusion, some, some of you may be frustrated and discouraged because of your ongoing struggle with sin. And that ongoing struggle with sin robs you of joy and makes you miserable. But if you didn't struggle with sin, you would not see your need for Jesus. God uses that struggle with sin to show us that we must have faith in Jesus. If we didn't struggle with sin, we wouldn't trust in him. But that frustration over our ongoing struggle with sin teaches us to trust him, to have faith in him. This should lead us to sing, Oh, happy day, oh, happy day, oh, happy day, when Jesus washed, when he washed my sins away. Oh, happy day, 
Oh, happy, wonderful day. Oh, happy day. When Jesus washed, washed my sins away. Amen. Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Amen. Let's close with prayer. Father in heaven, you are the Lord full of mercy. We cannot come before you claiming anything in and of ourselves. The only thing we have to offer is our sin. Lord, have mercy on us. Help people here to see their sin, to not go on blind to their heart's condition. Help them to be brokenhearted over their sin so that they run to you for mercy. Bless those who have heard the teaching of your word. Help them to cherish your word in their hearts. We pray in Jesus' name, amen.